Uh, well, uh, hi everyone. Um, today I would like to, uh, to discuss some of the challenges and um, pitfalls we, we've recognized when implementing uh, Snowplow. But, uh, but to start off, uh, of course, like every company, we have a mission. And uh, ours is, of course, data. Data drives business decisions. Data is trustworthy. Um, insights and analysis are part of daily business. People are data savvy and also our ADA IT infrastructure is at, uh, has data at its core. Very nice, of course, but to be able to actually achieve that, we've said we have five elements that drives the actual success. So that's besides technology and the data analytics and the management, it's also people and culture. And often that is forgotten, but uh, this is the last slide I will do for this kind of uh, introduction. But um, I still want to emphasize that, that it's really important to also take that always in consideration because otherwise it will fail uh, for sure. Um, then let's start with some of the, the, the challenges we, we've had at BVA when starting with, uh, with Snowplow. We are not just one company, we are BVA Auctions, but last summer we've uh, merged with Throwswag. So now we're two auction platforms. Each auction platform has uh, at least one app, a, a, uh, iOS or Android. Uh, and up until recently, we also had like a beta version of the website. So we have two versions of the website, another mobile website, and then we would also have some partner sites in real estate or arts and antiques. Well, are we going to implement Google Analytics on all of these websites, which all are implemented differently, have a different code stack? So um, that's actually also when our first chat was with Snowplow. How can we make it more scalable, simpler, that we say we create one kind of data pipeline that captures all the uh, different platforms we have, in, uh, in a uniform way, but where we can also uh, recognize users across all the platforms and the different channels. So uh, if somebody logs in on BVA, we store their user ID together with their cookie, and if he goes to Trostwijk and also logs in, we know we have the cookie ID, we have the user ID, and we know next time he comes to one of the two sites, a cookie ID is sufficient enough to do something with the data. And I emphasize to do something with the data because we aren't there yet to actually do something with the data, but we have the data. So we know who you are, but don't be afraid we don't do anything with it yet. Um, but it's also very important for us uh, because if you look at, just look at BVA, up until the merger we had uh, industrial and consumer goods on the same platform being sold. Um, where the types of users are completely different. They have a completely different behavior, completely uh, different goal. And even within the consumer goods, we have the bargain hunters, we have the people who actually come for a specific auction, specific product, we have uh, people doing all kinds of things. But up until now, we didn't have a clue what they were searching for, what they were going to do. And currently we're able to track it, but also at some stage, it will be perhaps possible that we say, okay, we have now such um, a base of users that is big enough in a certain area or a certain interest that we will create a new platform which has a different front end but sits on the uh, same back end. Uh, but out of the box, it will be tracked immediately because it is based on the same coding. So if but, uh, anybody has a question, please, uh, please shout. So we're also a two-sided uh, marketplace having indeed the two different types of uh, behaviors and the two different types of, um, of goals. Uh, and when we started, we didn't have an idea what those goals were. And still I would say we don't have an idea, but we're getting closer and closer and closer. Um, and uh, especially this morning when we had a chat with, uh, with Kara and Rebecca, we sell a lot of different items and each lot is uh, actually a single product. We don't have a product database yet <coughs> where products are stored and if we, and a uh, product database where all the products are stored and if we sell one product multiple times that we see, okay, we have product ID X, 
already sold five times. No, it's now it's five uh, lot items, lot IDs, and we don't even know if we have sold it already five times or put it in our shop. We had five bids, wasn't sold or uh, was sold, came back and we sold it again. So therefore, it's for us really important to know something about the different entities being, uh, for instance, a lot or a user or a seller together with the different events. So did it have uh, uh, bids? How many bids did it have? Uh, what were the different bid amounts placed by how many uh, different users? Did we see multiple bids on the same lots of a certain seller or was it widely uh, diverse between the, the different uh, lots? But also the composition of auctions because in some cases we have uh, multiple sellers in the same auction and if one uh, seller brings in, for instance, 10 tables, what does it do with the actual performance of the auction? Does it work better if we have more of the same lots or does it work better if we have a diversity in lots which are in, this, in essence more or less related. Um, and also uh, when um, lots are moving to their closing time, each time somebody bids in the last five minutes, the auction closing date is extended with another five minutes. But our current setup of tracking is that we don't track the actual uh, time of bidding we do it within a timestamp, but the actual closing time goes back with five minutes. So if I ju just did some uh, research lately and I couldn't find anyone who bid in the last five minutes. That's because every time the auction closing date was uh, driven back with another five minutes. So therefore it's also for us really important to understand the dynamics of our own website. And even though we already knew this, we forgot to implement it. Uh, let's move on. <coughs> Yeah, oh, nice, nice bridge. Um, <laughs> Good question. <laughs> yeah. um, so when uh, we only sell products from uh, companies, so companies are our uh, sourcing, our sellers, and for each uh, lot that is sold, we get a certain percentage. So for us, it's mo really important to have uh, as high a bid amount as high as possible. And therefore, we also try to now find out what, is the, what are the best dynamics to get as many bids on a certain lot. But is it also necessary to have as many bidders in one auction or in, uh, at one lot? Or is it is too sufficient enough? And in which category do we need what? And what timings are involved? And that's also really uh, relevant for this one. Because we have so many different context elements related to the actual uh, auctioning engagement and currently what we are tracking is did somebody place a bid, yes or no, and uh, what was the amount uh, of the bid and uh, we have some additional user information because we can e extract it from our different data. But all the different, uh, other different context elements that are available on the website, we are currently not yet tracking. So that's in our next phase, we're going to extend our tracking with way more uh, context elements. For instance, it's, uh, uh, you have to be logged in to place a bid. So, if we just look at the lot views and we see, let's say, 100k lot views, but only 25,000 of them are by locked in users, then we know the other 75k is useless for our bidding engagement because they will never be able to bid. If we know that they are users because we have their cookie, then why, are not they, uh, why aren't they logging in? And that gives us a lot of information, okay, what should we do with our lot pages? Who, are we, who do we need to target or how do we need to optimize those? Same is for favorites, is somebody looking a certain lot page uh, and has uh, that specific lot as a favorite? Well, it's way more likely that he's going to bid uh, opposite to those who don't have it as a favorite. And uh, this is just two different types of pages, but um, I can assure you that it will be quite a, a challenge to find all the relevant uh, context elements. But the setup within um, Snowplow now is that it's quite easy for us to also extend uh, 
uh, the different elements to track, especially if we look for the um, setup with entities and events where the entities actually never change, but the, uh, no, the entities don't change where the events can be, uh, be broadened. But it's also important to understand that the size of data is quite uh, challenging because we had a uh, redshift running smoothly and then we started with snowplow. <laughs> so after one month, we had to, uh, to add some notes. Okay, fine, still manageable and uh, okay. Finance wasn't that angry, so okay. A few weeks later, an extra note. A few weeks later, an extra note. Uh, so we grew from 400 uh, uh, gigabyte to 1.3 terabyte in like four months. And now Redshift is becoming quite expensive. Um, so therefore, we are moving to Snowflake uh, just now. But also, uh, with moving to Snowflake, um, and Snowflake having the ability to query JSON, uh, it's way easier for us to store more data in one cell and query it at a later stage and therefore make it more scalable and, and, and pushing more data to, uh, to, um, to Snowflake. And also because in Redshift, and correct me if I'm wrong, Kara, in Redshift everything is, when, when you push something to Redshift in an unstruct event, it's being placed in, uh, in a different table as where in, and you need to query it at a later stage to actually combine it again, whereas in Snowflake, you can query it in one go because it's in the same line. Correct, yeah? <laughs> okay, and just like somebody uh, mentioned, Snowplow is a data collection platform. So when you start using Snowplow, you get a shitload of data, but it doesn't say anything, and it doesn't show you anything. So be aware of that, that when starting with Snowplow and business is really excited so we, because we already told them, no, we're getting so much insight, we're getting so much data, and then Snowplow is implemented and then the day after say, okay, can you, see me, can you show me the graphs? No, we have the data. Yeah, okay, but when are you going to show me the graphs? <laughs> I first have to look through the data, I don't know what I'm capturing. And so that is quite a, a challenge. Um, to make sure that you uh, tell the business uh, that's in the end paying for it, uh, that they won't see anything in the first few <laughs> months. <laughs> most likely, most likely, yeah. Now also because they say, okay, can you show me that? Yeah, I, I guess so, let's see if we track that already. And they say, okay, no, we're not tracking that yet, <laughs> but that's in the next uh, iteration. So now we use uh, Power BI to uh, do the visualization. Works well for us, but we still need to do quite some data modeling because the data sets are becoming so enormous that before loading it into, uh, into Power BI is quite a challenge. And also because we want to uh, cache it up front so that when somebody queries something, it doesn't run an entire new query. And that's also something to, to remember because we have not only uh, running Snowplow into uh, Redshift, we're also having our um, customer service using Redshift and query uh, Redshift via um, paginated reports. It's a service of uh, Power BI. So we were sitting down with uh, Snowflake and we were trying to calculate what are we going to pay for Snowflake in comparison to Redshift. And there it came out that because uh, querying on Redshift is quite cheap because you pay in advance, and querying uh, Snowflake you pay for each query, be aware when moving to a different data warehouse that uh, upfront you f do some good investigation what kind of queries you're running and how often, because we're not going to move customer service to Snowflake. <laughs> um, Oh yeah, this one is also quite uh, relevant, I would say myself, uh, because we started off with only front-end tracking, um, but uh, as we soon uh, saw that not all of our um, data actually reaches the front-end, um, and we were missing data, and also because you can create auto-bits, and auto-bits actually place, take place in the server side, 
So uh, if, for instance, I can say I'm going to bid for this specific lot, I'm going to pay bid now 10 euros, but I'm willing to pay 50 euros. So up until it reaches 50 euro, every time somebody bids over my bid, I will automatically bid higher. But it all happens server side, and also the actual closing of a lot happens server side. So we never knew actually what kind of interaction took place within the different steps you actually did on the website. Therefore, we are now almost ready by setting up a front-end and server-side tracking um, setup, saying each time somebody does something in the front-end which makes an API call, the API call is sent via an event grid, which is Azure, and an Azure function to the Snow Plow uh, data pipeline. And also the front end sends uh, information and together they are stored again based on session ID or user ID and then pushed to, uh, to Snowflake and where we stitch it all together with all the uh, different information we have. And this would make it for us hopefully very attractive to, to scale up also with different data types uh, because not only our websites are connected to the event grid, but also different uh, tooling like CRM tooling or finance tooling will be connected to the event grid. And we can also use Snowplow then to push it to, um, to our data warehouse. Uh, well, and in the end it will look like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, questions? <laughs> Anyone? Yeah. So up front, how would you convince management that this is the way forward? Uh, <laughs> good. <laughs> good one. Uh, I, I often have a similar, no, not similar uh, case, because I have cases where I say, well, we'll just invest more in uh, what we have. Yeah. Well, the, we big or whatever, yeah. yeah, the lucky thing was uh, I was an external consultant before starting there, and uh, I was hired to actually do this. So uh, they say, OK. Yeah, so I said, okay, we need to do this. Say, okay. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, it was that easy. Yeah, wow. yeah okay. When we merged with the other company, it came a bit of a clash because they were using Segment and uh, we were using Snowplow and Power BI. Um, they were also using Power BI. But I strongly believe in using one tool that's really good at something instead of one, or one tool that does everything mediocre. Not saying that segment is mediocre, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I don't have uh, shares yet in Snowplow. <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry. Can you tell me something about the team and expertise you have? Because it sounds like you do a lot of infra and you do a lot of. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we're with two. <laughs> yeah, we're with two. So I'm, and I'm actually coming from more the business side with uh, a love for numbers, more like a commercial nerd. And then I have someone who's an actual <laughs> and understands uh, data <laughs> and, and, and can query really well and, and understands data infrastructures. And that, that's our main challenge in uh, scaling. So it all ends up with us and we're always the ones where everything holds, comes to hold. So that's, that's, that's now the problem we have, and that's hopefully we can solve it by setting it up more in a structured way. But the issue, of course, everybody knows if you show someone one thing, it will always lead into two new questions at least. So at this moment, we're not showing anything. <laughs> 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 or at least showing it only to a little uh, bunch of people, because otherwise we'll drown. So that, that's, uh, that, that's also a, a really good under, uh, thing to, to mention. Thanks for that. So, and it brings it back to people. When starting, know or, or try to figure out what you're up for and who's coming for which questions and does everybody understand business or uh, business and data? Because now most of the time we also have people coming to us saying, okay, can you help me with this? Yeah, what's your problem? And then they're like, Okay, but well, um, for what you were going to solve for me, yeah, I'm, I'm, I want to help you, but I first need to know what your problem is, and then I can help you to see if we can solve it with data. But yeah. yeah, the picture that uh, or the graph that you're showing there, I believe there was quite some implementation 
from either websites or this pages, one. Yeah. Yeah. So, but if you're only group user, I do at least have some. No, we have we have IT, but uh, of course the, the the technical implementation is done by IT, but we don't have our own uh, product. Yeah, but if there's any struggle in like, I, I mean, you need to put stuff on backlogs, like okay, the two guys, uh, this is yeah. very important. So yeah, whatever you're doing, your script planning, you yeah. need to implement this technology. Yeah, no, indeed, um, it is still quite a struggle. But um, last week I decided that I'm no longer going to put stuff on the backlog, but I'm going to make sure that the business owners are going to put their stories on the backlog, which, which every story needs uh, a checkbox for data. Okay. Does this data, does this story need data? If checkbox is yes, then they come to us and then we can say, okay, we need to do this and this and this. They're going to put it on the backlog and it will be their priority to make it happen because we don't have the leverage to push stuff up. Yeah. Make sure that this is implemented. Yeah, but uh, yeah. Well, yeah. At the moment, you get too many questions. You can move towards. You know what? Go talk to your manager because yeah. you need more people. Yeah. yeah. True. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> No, no, we don't have a data management platform. Um, and we're also not doing any personalization on, the on, the, on our platform yet. Um, I'm also not sure if we still would need a data platform nowadays because with the ability to actually make a direct connection via uh, different uh, um, uh, scripts or models, uh, directly to, to uh, data marts uh, that we don't need an actual um, data management platform in between. But that will be a challenge to make sure we have the right models to actually feed the, um, the website based on user behavior, based on offering, because offering each week is different. Um, so it will, will be a challenge, but we're, we're most likely going to solve it via that way. So without a data management platform, but directly ingesting via API trackers or oracles or um, something like that. Um, you mentioned Azure briefly. Is there a data warehouse technology? That yeah, so our entire, uh, well, we're entirely moving to Azure, but previous to the merger we had one company on Azure and the other was more Oracle uh, oriented. We're all going to Azure, uh, but our BI warehouse will be in Snowflake. The, uh, the rest of the production database, et cetera, will most likely be in Azure. Um, and we're still using Snowplow via AWS. Um, and I think our, our the, the, the blob search is also on uh, S3, right? Yeah. But perhaps that will be moving to Azure as well. Cool. Thanks. Thank